Hi, everybody. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to thank the uh, program committee and my peers for giving me the opportunity. Obviously, it was accepted, this, uh, this talk, but gave me the opportunity to present to you uh, my peers in the audience um, the value of Rotom when it comes to building out networks for Metro. Um, and in this case, specifically, data center interconnect. Um, so if we get a chance to get through all this agenda in the 45 minutes I have, that'll be great. But I want to give a little bit of background about data center interconnects, the typical standard point-to-point -point scenario that people use today and, and why and how, um, the value or need to migrate to Rotom when you start to have large numbers of local interconnects building mesh topologies, and then a comparison of uh, three Rotom architectures uh, the trade-offs associated with those, and then talk about optical spectrum. Um, there's a lot of people in the audience that are concerned with maximizing the amount of bandwidth on a given pair of fibers. And so when you look at those types of things, the trends in modulation to go from 10 gig to 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig on an individual channel um, becomes very, very important. And then um, flexible grid filter systems help to make that a possibility. And if I have a chance, we'll get into comparison of restoration options between optical using GMPLS as well as layer three using MPLS. So data center connects basically, when you look at the transport vendors that are out there in the world, there was a box that was essentially a multifunction box. And we were all at that time, we're going back to a network far, far away and a long time ago. You had to buy a box that was typically 14 RU form factor to put into the rack that you're gonna put the rest of your equipment into to be able to connect to a pair of fibers to distribute your traffic to either a peering location in an exchange location, et cetera. That large box, basically was a fixed size. You could not vary that size at all or, or optimize it. So that took up that space. If it was full with all kinds of cards, it was very well utilized. If it only had a couple of cards in it, the rest of that space was basically wasted for you to use in that, in that rack, in that location. And typically based on legacy types of devices, it also had DC power. So as we get into our locations that support AC only as we have today, you'd have to use some kind of rectification, AC rectifier, to be able to power those shells and be able to support stuff. Um, and density improvements for that really only came along when you had new cards come out with um, new port densities and things like that. The other thing with this, pluses and minuses. Um, so software is a very, very big part of all the things that we do. And in this application, every time you've brought a new card into the device to support a customer application, it required a large amount of regression testing to make sure the things that were already in that shelf and worked didn't get broken when you put the new function in and the new card in, so that you always had this burden of a very, very large and long regression cycle to make sure that what you put in the network uh, was going to work, and the new feature coming in was not going to kill something or stop it from working the network. The other problem is, just since these were old legacy types of platforms using uh, old, so old uh, programming codes, when we look at today's new application programming interfaces, things like NetComp, et cetera, those software stacks didn't talk NetComp or didn't really work with it. So you'd have to go off and do some level of translation to make this device operate like a router would or a um, set of servers would in your network today. And then again, the implement in implications of not being able to get fast turnaround time from vendors, having to wait for that regression testing, everything else. The technology might be available today, but it takes six months to be able to get it from the vendor because he has to do all that additional work to make it work in, in his box before it gets delivered to you to work in your network. So that really drove the need to start looking at disaggregating some of these functions. And so rather than going and having this big multifunction platform, what people have started to look at doing is to split that functionality out. The very first box that that's happened and one that has most of the value from a user perspective is the transponding function 
or moving uh, traffic from the router onto the fiber to be able to have it transported between locations. And so these boxes today are called things like pizza boxes and things like that, but essentially they're multiple sets of 10 gig, 40 gig, or 100 gig transponder clients connecting into routers and then being multiplexed onto higher bandwidth channels that are transported onto uh, a set of fibers using a multiplexer, demultiplexer function. So this disaggregation in the data center really started about five, six years ago with the Open Compute Project, OCP. Uh, we started with stuff inside the data center. So you first saw things like servers, top of rack switches, uh, aggregation switches now, and, uh, and that stuff all being basically brought to, brought to, to market, uh, I should say brought to standardization, and then put into the open community to be utilized and built by other people. Facebook has also come out from an infrastructure standpoint between data centers and now come out with what's called TIP, or Telecom Infra Project. Another scheme or means to try to basically remove the general purpose platforms that exist today and to getting more optimized functional boxes and essentially get what you want uh, and not pay for something you don't want and hopefully reduce the price for those selected features by customizing the box to do a single function, et cetera. Onos, um, uh, open network operating system started approximately two years ago as a scheme to be able to have an open interface to be able to uh, manage multiple vendors in a system, and there's a subset that they're working on called CORD, or Central Office Rearchitected as a data center, that a large number of the carriers are off supporting to be able to essentially start to put data centers out where their central offices are out far out in the network to be able to support end customers that are closer out to the edge of the networks. And now, uh, last year, uh, AT&T opened up uh, a new initiative called Open Rotom, where they've gotten all of their vendors to log in in order to basically build a reconfigurable optical address multiplexer that can interoperate at the line side, so do essentially a mid-span meet. Um, all these things are really trying to make it open systems so that you can basically have anybody's line system and anybody else's transponding function and have them basically sit together and work in a given customer's network. How's this working for you guys from a flow perspective? Good? Not too fast? not too slow. Great. So let's talk about the, the very first start of what we're very, very familiar with in views, which is this point-to-point -point configuration. So there's four main things that we worry about as providers in the network. One is cost for power, cost for space, cost for connectivity, and security. Those four things. It is easy to be able to basically go and reside all of your equipment inside the internet exchange point if there was space and power available to do that. But the cost for that typically is extremely high. And so most people will try to go and move their equipment into an off-site location, a data center or a co-location facility, and then connect into that um, inter-exchange peering location. I want to say just two things as caveats or, or things here when I go through this, to this, this talk, and that is the expectation I have is the stuff we're talking about is done by everybody, meaning routers at a local, at a local or offsite data center going into a peering point. Whether you have leased wavelengths to do that, to get connected into there using someone else's infrastructure, or you have made the decision you're gonna go off and buy dark fiber to do that and have two fiber connections into that location, I'm of the latter port, right? So you've already made the decision you've not gonna locate directly into that peering location and you're not gonna go and lease wavelengths to connect there. You have enough bandwidth, enough traffic to justify having bought or leased a pair of fibers to put your own transponder functions and your connections from your router to get into that location you want to get to, okay? So some of you in the room may not talk or use much of this talk after that, but if you are basically doing fiber infrastructure today, then um, this should be interesting to you. The value of this concept here of using fiber to basically connect there is you have the ability, it's a very, very small footprint if we use these pizza boxes as the transponding functions and a mux-demux to multiplex 
all those individual channels onto a single pair of fibers to transport between those two locations. It's very, very simple. It's a pay as you grow, and the ad capacity is very simple because it's very, very point to point. So there are no real issues as long as we stay in this single, single, simple point to point configuration. The problem is, hello? Okay, great. If we get to a point where we're either very successful and we have lots and lots of location points, or we need to do replication within a metropolitan area, or we have other points we need to basically home into to a location, we need to get into a mesh type of configuration. And so this concept we're talking about is all about when you get in from a, strand, a, st a straight point to point to a mesh architecture, and what you need to look at and consider whether you can do that using the standard point-to-point -point configuration or move to a new architecture. So if you look at it from a point-to-point -point perspective, in this case we're showing the four nodes, the standard math to make the decision of how to support a full mesh, we are bouncing back and forth on this, guys, just reference point, and I'm standing in one spot. When we do that, you basically have an n times n minus one set of connections. So in this case, it's four nodes, times three, 12 connections, or six fiber pairs to basically make this operation work in a full mesh configuration. And every one of those fiber pairs has a set of mux demuxes on it and a transponding function on it. So in this scenario, we have basically three mux demuxes as well as three sets of transponding functions, one per pair of fiber at each one of the locations of the network. What this also does, when we look at it from a transponder pizza box function is, that's instead of having a single box at each one of the locations, we now have three boxes that have IP addresses. So we went from having four IP addresses in the network to be managed to now having 12 IP addresses in the network to be managed. So configuration, management, control, security, all becomes a bigger issue now since I'm now breaking down the network um, into smaller functions, but having to have those all be accessed and managed as IP addresses into my NOC center, so that becomes an issue. The other part about point-to-point -point configurations is that all the traffic is terminated at the MUX DMUX unit. So there is no pass-through that occurs from node A through node B to get to node C. It does not happen in that scenario. So that works really well, that architecture, when we have lots of fiber and fiber is cheap. If you don't have a lot of fiber, or fiber is very expensive, then you get into a situation where you want to try to do the same kind of configuration. And if you want to still try to use this point-to-point -point configuration, you get into a need to do this pass-through and the logical concept of doing pass-through on a pair of fibers. Um, and dealing with the loss associated with multiple MUX DMUX units. So, I'm sorry, wrong button. So if I'm trying to move traffic from this node, this pink connection here, through this location here to drop at this location here where I really want to get to, so going from, this mean clockwise, node A through A, B, C, D, trying to get through to C through node D, I have to deal with the loss of the fiber between A and D, as well as the loss of the fiber between C and D, and the loss of the four sets of muxes along the way. Typically, that loss will be greater than the receive power on the transponding function at this site over here, which then says, I can't really make this work, I can't do regeneration, or if I do, it becomes very expensive because I need to have additional sets of transponders to make that work. So when you go and put in amplifiers to try and get through the, all the losses there. When you get to the point of saying, I'm going to put amplifiers in, you might as well stop there because it becomes extremely complex and I won't get into all the issues about power balancing and things like that at this point in time. But safe to say, the thing to do at that point is now to look at migrating to Rotom. So in the audience, who is familiar with the term reconfigurable optical ad drop multiplexer? Show of hands. Good, I got the Rotom guys in today, the optical guys, not just the data packet guys. So, again, concept, two things. So I basically show four nodes on this connection, because I want to do that for a reason, because I did a bunch of math being an architect. 
of looking at what it costs based on six pairs of fibers versus one pair of fibers, two Rotom cards versus three sets of MUX-DMUXs, and said, at four nodes in a mesh configuration, this is a break-even point. A lot of guys thought Rotom would be very, very expensive compared to doing multiple MUX-DMUX units, but reality is Rotom is actually very inexpensive now because of how we've gone off and made the connection and built it and done the integration of taking all the functions that used to be separate in a Rotom and put them into a single card to make it very, very cost effective. So what's nice about Rotom that you saw in the other slide that was difficult is Rotoms are designed to support pass-through. There are five major blocks that work inside these integrated Rotom cards. You have your preamplifier, which actually takes the signals that comes in and amplifies it before it comes through the Rotom, goes through the MUX DMUX, and drops to the transponder. You have a post amplifier that basically takes the signal coming off of the Rotom card before it goes on to the line side fiber to amplify that to make sure it can go across the span of fiber to get to the next node. You have internally a wavelength selective switch that essentially determines whether that wavelength is going to be dropped at that site or pass through at that site to go to the next site down the way. You have a, ch a channel optical uh, monitoring block, or OCM, which monitors the per channel power and also supports a VOA, a variable optical amplifier internally to manage the power of each one of those channels to make sure that they're spectrally flat going out of the system. And the last and most important piece is the optical service channel, or OSC, and I'll show this on a couple slides, but that is the communication link between the two Rotom nodes that allows them to figure out what the distance is between them to optimize the amplifier gain on the preamp and the postamp to maximize the effectiveness for any given amount of bandwidth that sits on that fiber going between those two nodes. The other value is when you go to Rotom, as you basically go off and you build these networks and you want to start adding capacity, you can start to basically add more, as much capacity as you want to, and the Rotoms themselves will automatically reset the amplifier gain between the nodes to make sure that you never violate any of the design rules required and cause stress at the network level. So that's a value that is known but not always seen because it's done automatically behind the scenes for you as a, as a network operator. The other thing that's nice is when I add the fifth node, so let's go back to our conversation of point to point. So I said four nodes, 12 pairs of, uh, six pairs of fibers, I add a fifth node in, in my point to point scenario, I now have four connections at each one of the nodes, five times four is 20 fibers, 10 fiber pairs. I've now almost doubled the amount of fiber pairs just by adding in one more node. So my cost on the fiber side has gone up dramatically if I'm leasing fiber to support point to point. In the case of Rotom, my fiber cost is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. I've now added a new node based upon the need to go and have a new ad drop location because of the growth in the network or the set of customers I need to have or more replication or whatever the need is. Adding nodes becomes very, very simple in a Rotom configuration because of this OSC or optical supervisory channel. What that channel does is, assuming that there was originally a 50 kilometer span between node A and node D as we had before, and now I've added node E, and this node is going in between that 50 kilometer span, the amplifiers here were set to support a certain amount of gain because of 50 kilometers. When that new node goes in, its OSC fires up, it starts communicating with the two adjacent nodes. They figure out, based on a ping pong type of algorithm, that I'm now only at 20 kilometers, I'm at 30 kilometers, readjust the gain of the amplifier here and here, he sets his amplifier gain based upon the span distance, and everything is happy. Cross connects for any uh, additional channels need to be dropped at that site are basically built, and all the pass-through channels that went between A and D continue um, through the WSS that's now in the new node E. So again, node adds, additional pass-through traffic being brought up, new bandwidth being allocated in, all is easily done. The only issue is making sure you keep control of channel planning. And typically, 
these rotom architectures and the management systems associated with them can tell you what channels are available or open on a given channel plan without having to worry about I'm provisioning the wrong channel on this network because it's already in use someplace else by one of the nodes in the network. So they're very, very smart in making that happen. Benefits and architectures. So that kind of gives you a, the quick highlight on Rotom compared to um, doing point-to-point -point fixed configurations. Again, I mentioned the fact that at four nodes, it basically gets to the point of paying, uh, paying for itself by putting Rotom in compared to the original point-to-point -point configuration. At five nodes, we're way ahead, and it makes a logical sense. Now, a lot of people have been told we have Rotom in our network. They don't know why. They don't know how. All they know is it's there. Um, and that's what the optics guys do, and I'm basically working on my router configurations, my policies for my different flows, and my security, my MACSEC, whatever, for my security for all my flows. They don't really care, and that's what you want to have, is have the optical network be that transparent to what's going on at the packet level inside the network. And so Rotom basically does that. So from an engineering perspective, there is no pre-planning required for the most part. If you've got a 44-channel system, an 88-channel system, a 96-channel system, basically the system will tell you what channels are available and let you basically add channels as you want to. Um, there's an architecture which we'll talk about that also supports a term called flex grid and super channel, and we'll go over that in a little more detail. Um, the network level topology discovery basically allows you to know span distance, lost optical backscatter reflectance, to know basically if you have an issue with uh, fiber or something else, and your adjacent neighbors to be able to do provisioning of wavelengths across the network. And again, we said nodes are added very simply, and the dynamic channel adds mean there's truck rolls only needed at the endpoints of the network. I don't have to go do anything at any intermediate nodes or at the core of the network. Everything is plug and play no rebalancing required, and from an optics perspective, things are sweet. It also gives you the ability to have great levels of diagnostics at the network. So, so routers don't really know what's going on at optical layer. They just know, are packets running? And am I having any errors or retransmissions being required because something's going on at the network? I don't know. Rotom's allow you to be able to see per channel what's happening, which translates back into what's happening on one or multiple sets of flows across that channel. So per channel, all channel aggregate signal, each service channel within that channel, assuming you have a bunch of 10 gigs that are multiplexed on to 100 gig wavelength and going across the Rotom network, and then any other composite levels across the, across the network. The only place you don't have visibility is within the Rotom block itself. So no re-engineering, fewer truck rolls, and shorter and hopefully fewer maintenance windows as well with need just to go and add channels at the endpoints and not in the core of the network. So the first Rotom architecture I call the classic Rotom architecture because it essentially uses fixed filters to drop channels at the local, local location. And again, this is a two degree system as we showed because it's a single pair of fibers being split with an east degree and a west degree. And the classic is a one by nine, and so all the channels will pass through unless those that need to be dropped, and if they need to be dropped, there'll be a cross-connect built to drop that individual wavelength out. It'll go out the output port of the drop port of the MUX, uh, I should say of the Rotom, and hit the MUX DMUX and then hit a optical transponding function beneath it. Um, so typically these are colored, they're directional, and they're also fixed, meaning each port is specific to a certain wavelength. And I have to make sure that my optical transponder that's connected to that port is that wavelength, or else it won't be transmitted across into the Rotom. It'll be blocked. Second architecture is a little bit of a deviation off of that, and it's basically called a CD Rotom, C being colorless and D being directionless. So typically when you go from being a two degree system to a four or a larger degree system, what happens is you want to be able to have the ability to drop any channel from any one of those degrees at that site. And so this directionless card allows that ability because it has a WSS in it and also a wavelength routing function inside there. So it supports the ability to basically, basically drop any colored wavelength from any degree at that site to that location. The one constraint is it still has an issue if that color is already being used on that drop block, you can't 
drop a second one in the same exact channel at that site. And that's where the next option comes into play, which is called CDC and a, a, a version called F for FlexGrid. So CDC stands for colorless, directionless, like we had for the first or second version, as well as now contentionless. And contentionless occurs because I can take any channel that comes in off of any degree and I can drop it into a multicast switch. And the multicast switch says, if this port is already being consumed, I'll take it to another port over here off the multicast switch, and it can be exactly the same wavelength. So it allows you to basically have the same channel dropped multiple times at the same location. This has a lot of value in long haul networks, long haul mesh networks, especially because it helps resolve issues with channel planning. It may not be so valuable in metro networks where you have a very good handle on how many lengths are out there, which ones are being consumed, which ones are available, et cetera. So long haul, very, very important. Metro, maybe not so important, but the one thing that CDCF has is that F term, which is flex grid. So as we start getting into higher and higher bandwidth modulation techniques, flex grid becomes extremely important to optimize the amount of bandwidth you put on a given pair of fibers, and we'll talk about that. So we started basically with point to point early 2000s and before the first generation set of rotoms came out in the 2005, 2006 timeframe, basically two degree, maybe four degree in supporting ring configurations with local ad drop and the ability to migrate into 100 gig wavelengths. Um, CD configuration rotoms came in with WSS to support uh, more mesh type architectures. So, excuse me, wrong button again, my apologies. So this is basically one ring potentially, a second ring and a third ring all connected through one node here uh, with additional connection nodes here, here, et cetera. So in this case, a three, three ring configuration tied together as a single mesh, the connectionless and directionless becomes very, very important to make you be able to drop any wavelength any place you want in that scenario and that's why uh, that configuration has been used in metro as well as regional and long haul networks. And now we're basically moving into these dynamic optical networks using FlexGrid Rotom to support higher modulation techniques to do 100 gig, 200 gig, 400 gig wavelengths with those same 10, 100 uh, clients beneath them. And the ability to now add in support for SDN control, orchestration, hierarchical managers, and optical layer restoration and optimization using GMPLS. So this is the look and feel of the classic uh, fixed bandwidth, fixed grid rotum. And again, the five blocks I mentioned, ingress, egress, OSC, WSS, OCM. At one time, those were all separate blocks. Today, you can go get that as a single card in a system from six different vendors. So the integration of making this type of rotum function work and be a single block function allows it to work very, very well in this disaggregated concept or requirement that's being requested from vendors. The one issue is because it's fixed, meaning the, the filters are fixed, it's either 100 gigahertz or 50 gigahertz filter. So it may have impact on some of these higher modulation techniques going forward. The CD Rotom looks exactly the same initially, and what can happen is you can adapt and add in this additional block. And again, as I said before, you have a WSS, which essentially allows any one of those multiple degrees to be able to drop that channel out into the WSS. It determines where that needs to be basically uh, cross-connected and dropped out to go to a colorless wavelength router to be handed off to the optical transponders sitting beneath it. So again, this allows in a multi-degree type of architecture the ability to be able to drop any channel you want from multiple degrees by going to this type of architecture. Very, very strong benefit in multi-connected networks as we saw before. CDCF is a very complex beast from an architecture perspective. Um, the benefit, of course, is this MCS or uh, multicast switch at the bottom, which allows me to drop the same wavelength multiple times at a given site, so there is no contention occurring at the drop site in that location. And the ability to do flex grid, so I can now do higher modulation techniques, 
200 gig, 250 gig, 400 gig, as well as support super channels, which give me better spectral density. Spectral density, it's a big term. Anybody know what that means? Hands? So spectral density is all about how many channels and the bandwidth of each one of those channels I can have for a given amount of spectrum on a pair of fibers. In this case, we're talking C-band only, which is roughly 4,400 or 4,800 uh, gigahertz of spectrum. And what FlexGrid allows us to do is to be able to essentially move traffic um, to any size grid I want based upon the modulation technique, and I'll show you that in two slides. So just quick things again. For Metro, CDCF is not as important except for the concept for flex grid and for super channels. Um, it costs a lot more than obviously a fixed filter system because you have that multicast switch, you have a bunch of amplifiers to deal with the loss of that switch, um, and you typically have a much higher uh, degree WSS associated with that architecture. So quick thing on the trade-offs. So you look at the architectures, the three I mentioned, and the thing I like to talk to about people is, is what is the bandwidth requirement you're looking for? How much do you really want to have on the network? Um, sure, it's nice to have state-of-the-art CDCF. Are you willing to pay for that to be able to support only 44 or 88 channels? And let's say, um, in the case of 88 channels at 100 gig each, eight. 0.8 terabits of traffic on a given pair of fibers. If that's more than enough capacity, there probably is not a need to go off and do something with FlexGrid, which supports CDC, because typically that's a 39% premium just for the MUX DMUX function, the MCS function of FlexGrid compared to doing a fixed grid amplifier situation. Super channel is also, again, something great for spectral density, but again, if you don't have a need to have a channel that is tightly coupled two to four to eight channels into a very, very tight amount of spectrum to maximize the number of channels and the total bandwidth in the fiber, in this case, adding about four terabits of capacity to a given pair of fibers, then probably not worth spending the money to have flex grid. If you look at what people have put in today, so I have a legacy network, but they want to still maximize the amount of spectrum capacity in that network. The things they can do, things that are very effective, is add in the new modulation techniques. So they have a Rotom system that's three to five years old. It's a fixed grid system. It supports 50 gigahertz. They've been putting 10 gig in for a number of years. They just recently upgraded the backbone to 100 gig using a modulation technique called uh, PMQPSK. They can now move to a technique called 8QAM or 16QAM in the metro space and potentially 64QAM to go from 100 gig to 200 or 250 gig or 400 gig for a given channel with that same spectrum. And now I've gone from 8.8 .8 terabits to 19.2 terabits, so I've doubled the amount of capacity on that given pair of fibers just by changing modulation technique and not changing any of the infrastructure at the Rotom level. So this is what FlexGrid looks like compared to fixed filter. So the top is basically showing a fixed filter architecture using 50 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz space filters. And so what I'm showing on the right hand side are the different modulation techniques that are available. So the one that people have been using for now about four years is this thing called 100 gig coherent QPSK, or a quadrature phase shift key. It basically fits within a 50 gigahertz window, so it fits very, very nicely into a 100 gigahertz or 50 gigahertz grid fixed filter system. 16 qualm, also 200 gig per but because you're now running a different modulation technique, you can't go the same amount of distance. You're using more carriers to do the same amount of bandwidth across um, a same amount of spectrum. You can now double that capacity. Again, my apologies, wrong button. Wow, I went way back.
and can now double that capacity to basically 17.6 terabits or twice the amount just by changing the modulation technique and still running the same filter capacity. AQAM and this other techniques, SP, QPSK, are basically long haul, ultra long haul type modulation techniques, which typically take a larger size because the actual bandwidth of the signal is 62 and a half gigahertz, and so they fit in a larger uh, channel width, so they would be required to fit in a 100 gigahertz uh, filter system only. You could not put them into 50 gigahertz and run them through a Drotum type network with a bunch of pass through. Point to point, it would work, but it would not work well in multiple nodes being passed through. And then down below, by going to flex grid, what happens is you're taking yourself off of the ITU 50 gigahertz grid completely and looking at everything at 12 and a half gigahertz slices, if you will, and now optimizing based upon each modulation technique the size of the filter for that bandwidth of that modulation technique. So I can very tightly couple all these channels together to optimize and grow the amount of capacity on that pair of fibers just by going to FlexGrid. Again, you're paying money for this, but if spectrum is important, you can go and put 64 qualm in and put 30 terabits of traffic on a given pair of fibers. We're going to get to restoration after all. This has been going faster than I thought, but I appreciate it very much. So in today's networks at the optical, if we have a mesh configuration taking a wavelength signal that's basically sitting between an A and a Z node going through a set of rotums, um, typically for layer one zero restoration, if we're not using an optical protection switch, but using GMPLS based restoration, you're going to see restoration occur in the event of a failure in roughly 10 to 30 seconds if you haven't predefined a backup route. If you have backup routes already predefined, then the protection switch occurs in roughly 50 milliseconds or less. Um, this ability of basically having shared protection allows you to basically optimize and reduce the amount of spare capacity sitting in the network to do protection. But in the event that you want to have every, every circuit protected or every wavelength protected, you'd still be at a one-for-one one type of protection scheme and half the bandwidth in the network would be used for protection, just like we had in Sonnet in the old days. Looking at layer through restoration techniques, again, assuming the same wavelength channel, and again, we're not doing anything with the optical layer. Everything, everything the optical layer is already there and running. We're looking at layer three restoration using MPLS. And again, the concept here, same thing. I might go ahead and use that same route that was already basically done in the optical layer as well because the capacity is available on that route and it's the best one to use based on access or excess capacity. But you might also go ahead and redefine things and have a predefined route going through this way and have traffic going there and have it restored in 50 milliseconds. So. Uh, layer 3 restoration obviously does not work as fast as layer 0 restoration, but it can be more effective because you're looking at things at the flow level as opposed to looking at things at the wavelength level for certain flows and things like that and prioritizing those types of things. So quick summary conclusions. So looking at the fixed rotum as disaggregated solution and comparing it as doing a shell function or a per function architecture. So when I say shelf, we're still doing optimize. So I'm still looking at saying in the case of Rotom, I've got a single Rotom card that does a degree function in there. So um, if I'm looking at something that's two degrees, four degrees, six degrees, having all those Rotom cards sitting in a single shelf with a single set of controllers to manage all of those Rotom cards, I'm actually better off from a physical perspective than trying to go and have each of those rotums be an individual box and then having to figure out how to manage each one of those separate four to eight boxes and then have them also communicate, assuming there's a communications channel between them, to have them know they're connected to each other to be able to support that functionality. So in the case of the shelf-based architecture for high-density integrated rotum compared to single function rotum cards, uh, white box if you will, with multiple IP addresses, you're probably better off for minimize of space, power, as well as minimize of IP uh, man management requirements to go and stay with a shelf-based architecture that is Rotom-centric. 
From a software's perspective, you still have an advantage, but it's a slight advantage in the function-based thing because you don't have all the regression required in, in the case of a, a large multi-card uh, shelf architecture. So you still have that, but since we're only talking about a single type of function, meaning in this case a rotum, the amount of regression testing is greatly reduced. And so the advantage that you would have having a function-centric architecture versus a shelf architecture for dedicated rotum actually still shows a little bit of value add of going to single shelf, multi-card, then multi-shelf, single function per card, and all the IP addresses associated with that. And again, assuming new, new architectures, the APIs are there now to go and support the new generation of cards to go and match what we're doing in the data center. And then from a speed perspective, I think you still have advantage with regard to function-centric architectures that you can support uh, faster bringing out a new card, new function without having to worry about a controller that manages more than just a single card, single function in the case of a shelf-based architecture. So, quick things. So from a DCI perspective, disaggregation of transponder has already been proven as being the most valuable thing to do from a CSP, ICP, CNP co-mobile provider. If you get into mesh architectures, Rotom simplifies the ads and changes the network, makes things very, very simple, easy to scale from a bandwidth perspective as well as dynamically add channels without having to go and change anything in the network. Just add the channels at the endpoints and then move forward, plug and play. Um, Rotom supports and actually uh, makes valuable the ability to basically go off and build larger and larger mesh scenarios. So you start with four, you go to six, you go to ten. Rotom continues to grow and expand easily, simply. The only issue you have to worry about is channel plan. And again, the systems are sophisticated enough that they tell you when a channel is already active in the network if you can't get it between A and Z across the, across the design. And I think from a metro perspective, the simple fixed grid rotum with the ability to go and use new modulation techniques to increase the amount of bandwidth spectrum um, for a given pair of fibers is probably a better way to go from a cost perspective than trying to go to a full CDC flex grid architecture unless super channel is very, very important to you for whatever reason. Um, the industry consortiums that are there will continue to go and, and build things, open source that, bring it to the, to the network community, um, give it to the vendors to go off and build. That will continue to go on and try to make things interoperable. I think the big challenges we will see still for the next few years is how to go and support multi-vendor control um, at a hierarchical control level, as well as how to deal with the classic multi-layer protection scheme, which is better and then how to deal with wavelength routing, and of course always the analog functions. But since it's Rotom, that's all taken care of autonomously by the Rotom, the higher layer system should have to worry about those things. And with that, I'll take any questions. Matt, I knew you'd be first. Matt Petak, Yahoo. Uh, good talk, Steve, thank you very much on that. Um, I think there's two points I wanted to make. Um, one, which is there are definite trade-offs in terms of the uh, DB losses as you get to fancier and fancier systems uh, when you start getting into the, the CDC, flex grid style, uh, yep. MUX, DMUX. If you're worried about uh, distances on your, your optical system, do recognize that it's not just a, ah, I can pull out my very simple uh, fixed filter from years ago, throw in a, a flex grid CDCF Rotom system, and I'll get the same distance out of it. You generally will have increased losses that you have to account for. So your, your distances, you may not get quite as far as you thought you would with the Agreed. fancier systems. Agreed. And again, I think that the key thing here is there are always trade-offs. So in my opinion, and, and very good point, Matt, and I, I applaud you for that, is you look at everything. What's the cost for fiber? Again, point to point is the simplest thing to do, probably the most effective thing to do when it makes sense. But if fiber is not readily available or it's very expensive, then hardware can take the place of fiber multiplication, right? And that's the whole value behind dense weight division multiplexing by doing virtual fiber 
over the ones that a fiber chip got in adding hardware. What we're seeing, and what we have seen now over the past year is that the technology that allows you to basically make that decision easier, i.e. going to hardware implementations, rotom, et cetera, versus staying, staying with fixed, uh, fixed filter and point-to-point um, and -point multi-fiber, is the cost has gone down dramatically, 60%. I mean, I've, I'm, I've been amazed at how much we've dropped the price on rotom from a hardware perspective across the industry to make this work for our networks and our industry here for data center. A second point being, if your layer three restoration is really taking 500 seconds, I, I think you need a, a different layer three router vendor because that's uh, I agree. <laughs> I agree. And again, the concept what I said there was you didn't run MPLS, you were basically trying to rediscover a, a path at that point in time in that scenario, right? If you'd already had predefined routes, it wouldn't be all that. You'd, you'd be 50 milliseconds or less. Even if you're, you're just running ISIS, uh, 500, mil, uh, 500 seconds, you said? That wasn't milliseconds, it was Yeah, seconds. 100 to 500 seconds. Uh, that's seven minutes, eight minutes? Yeah. I suck at math. It's a long time. That's, that, that shouldn't be an acceptable answer from any router vendor. I would agree with you. All right. Anyone else in the room? Great. All right, we'll go to the next speaker then. Thank you very much.